St. Louis. I do. Okay. Uh, Mr. Gibson is here to uh, speak with us this morning. And I want to uh, first say that uh, Krista Barber can be here uh, because she has a work study program. She has put she set up this and uh, arranged all the food and everything. And uh, so I think they uh, remember her uh, for uh, her work in setting this up. Uh, Mr. Gibson is a professor at um, Washington University in St. Louis. He's well known for uh, as a political scientist, uh, specifically for his work in South Africa. Uh, he was uh, professor extraordinary in political science at Stellenbosch University, and he's uh, director of the program of citizenship and democratic values uh, at the Wyden Weidenbaum Center on e Economy, Government, and Public Policy. He's well published uh, nationally and internationally and has received uh, numerous awards for his work, including uh, his work on apartheid in South Africa. And one of his particular interests is demo uh, <laughs> democratiza democratization. And uh, specifically today, uh, he's going to be talking about um, conflict of interest, recusal, and campaign contribution issues that have been highlighted, I think, in the 2009 case of uh, Caperton v. Massey in uh, uh, West Virginia and uh, actually to the Supreme Court. And with that, I think we'll turn it over to you. The city wants to have a discussion, so please uh, don't be shy about contributing. Thank you. Uh, of course, I'm talking about the Caperton uh, research at lunch today. I think maybe you all have uh, seen this legal realism paper for this morning. No, that's, that's, uh, that's, uh, the law and politics course. Yes. That's what? That was, that's for Professor Devin's class. He assigned gotcha. the reading, so we haven't seen uh, Some people here, I think, uh, some people here may be in that class, but. But most not. And most have not read the Caperton paper either, right? Yeah, OK. OK, it's not a big deal, because I wasn't going to rely on it very much. Um, one thing that I've been concerned about for the last 30 to 35 years in my research is the connection between um, institutions and the public. Uh, the first book I wrote was a book on uh, Skokie, Illinois, and the conflict um, caused by the Nazis attempting to demonstrate in Skokie. And um, sort of the premise of that book was that uh, the First Amendment tells us just about nothing about this case. Uh, instead, we have to uh, look to a public opinion, to a lead opinion, uh, we have to look to the context to try to understand how freedom actually gets exercised. Um, the, the First Amendment is not a very clear guide to uh, freedom in practice. So since then, I've been very interested in the question of public opinion, and in particular, the question of the legitimacy of courts throughout the world. Now, um, the ultimate focus of this research is obedience and compliance. So the big question is, why do people um, comply with the law? Why do they obey the law? Why do they acquiesce when uh, uh, they're losing in uh, legal and political disputes? It's a big question. Um, in uh, my case, I focus a lot on high courts. And as you probably know, uh, some high courts rule and their decisions are unpopular, uh, but they are widely accepted and life goes on as normal. Other courts rule, however, for instance, the Nigerian Constitutional Court two years ago ruled in the context of deciding that election and the court building was attacked and burned. The same is true in Pakistan. Uh, in Bulgaria, the Constitutional Court uh, ruled on some land issues, riots, uh, broke out throughout the country. Uh, the worst, worst possible thing happened to the justices. First, the government took away their chauffeurs, and then secondly, they turned off the electricity in a 30-store uh, office building, so the judges had to walk up the stairs to get to uh, their, uh, their courthouse. Uh, in Japan, if a judge rules against the uh, ruling party, uh, he or she is banished to non-Tokyo. Apparently, there's about one good place to live in Japan, and if you don't live in Tokyo, you're in big trouble. Uh, so courts get punished for making their decisions all the time. Uh, in this case, in the case of the US, 
uh, obviously FDR, Roosevelt tried to punish the Supreme Court by uh, changing the size of the court. Uh, he was opposed to their uh, rulings on the constitutionality of the uh, New Deal uh, and sought to pack the court. He failed. He failed in short because of the legitimacy that the court had, but he failed. Uh, today, every uh, session of Congress, uh, new bills are introduced to attack the Supreme Court. Uh, where is it most vulnerable? Obviously, jurisdiction. Because jurisdiction is uh, not constitutionally determined, neither a size, uh, one of it. Jurisdiction is not constitutionally uh, determined, so uh, Ron Paul and a bunch of uh, people introduce in every uh, session uh, bills that would take away uh, same-sex marriage, would take away abortion, would take away uh, blah, blah, blah. It's actually a very substantial list that would bar the court, uh, that, would, that would be excluded from the jurisdiction of the federal courts. Obviously, um, the Pledge of Allegiance uh, generated a lot of legislation attacking the court. As it turns out, over the course of American history, there have been a lot of attacks on the U.S. Supreme Court, and many of them have uh, actually succeeded. So the question is, how can an institution uh, get enough political capital to fend off against these kinds of attacks? And um, the answer that I provide to that question is mass legitimacy. And that is the willingness of people to accept that the institution is the appropriate arbiter for disputes, the willingness of people to acquiesce to the decisions of the institution, even when they're losing. I always say that legitimacy is for losers, because if you win, you very rarely question the authority of the institution to make the decision. If you lose, however, the first thing you question is whether that institution has the authority to make the decision. I'll give you the, the poster child for this theory, and it's Bush versus Gore. Uh, Bush versus Gore uh, should have been catastrophic for the U.S. Supreme Court. Uh, all the elements are there, about as politicized as you can get, 5-4 uh, divided by party, uh, by all accounts activist in the sense that the U.S. Supreme Court had never really intervened in state uh, elections before. Uh, Sandra Day O'Connor's at a cocktail party uh, before the decision is announced and was told that Gore was going to win. And she said, oh, that would be horrible. We must do something about it. So you've got everything in place for the Supreme Court to, as many people have said, uh, 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 execute a self-inflicted wound on its legitimacy. So what happens? In Bush versus Gore, uh, the court rules, um, Gore, uh, uh, Gore immediately craters. Uh, I think Gore craters largely because he's read my work. And he understands that an attack on the Supreme Court would not resonate with the American people. Uh, in my own research, I show that Republican uh, support for the court went up. Is that surprising? No, but Democratic support for the court went up, and African American support for the court went up. Went up. Indeed, I do a survey every year, and the legitimacy of the U.S. Supreme Court uh, reached its apogee in uh, 2001. It was the highest point of its legitimacy, when in fact it should have been the lowest point. Now. I've got to be a little bit careful here. Uh, I'm talking about the mass public. As you probably know, 557 law professors published an advertisement in the New York Times after Bush versus Gore, uh, saying it was a self-inflicted wound and accusing the decision of being an illegitimate stealing of the US presidency. Uh, that sort of argument did not resonate with the American people. Instead, they viewed the court um, as the appropriate authority for making the decision and therefore were willing to accept it even if they were losing, even if they opposed the, the uh, court's uh, decision. So, you know, this legitimacy stuff is real, real important. I mean, obviously we don't have a clue, but my guess is in 1801, the U.S. Supreme Court had no legitimacy and therefore its term could be, could be abolished. 
my guess is that in 1937, the reason why Roosevelt failed was because the mass public was not willing to support a fundamental alteration in the institution. I don't know too much about the last size change, wasn't it in 1876 or somewhere around in there? Uh, but clearly the court did not have enough legitimacy to withstand that attack. So I think it's real, real important. Now, here's the question. Where does it come from? If you listen to Supreme Court justices, if you listen to any judge, uh, they, at the end of the day, will uh, claim to be only implementing law, interpreting law. Uh, if you talk to them very long, they'll talk about uh, syllogisms. Uh, they'll talk about law as a, a form of a deduction. They'll talk about the absence of ideology in it. They'll talk about it as a mechanical process. Uh, they'll do, uh, put forth what we sometimes call the myth of legality. And that is that judges start with the major premise, which is the law. They uh, then observe the facts, and of course an appellate judge gets the facts from the trial court judge, at least in principle, and then simply deduces an answer. Uh, Roscoe Pound in 1908 called it mechanical jurisprudence. Now, if one is a mechanic, then one should only be held accountable when the bridge fails, when the dike fails, when the dam fails, or when the economy fails, because the same thing applies to the logic of the Fed. If they're nothing but technicians, then we want to hire really smart people who run these deductions very, very well. And as you probably know, a Democrat does a deduction the same as a Republican, and a woman the same as a man, and a black person the same as a Hispanic person. So this mechanical jurisprudence model actually provides at least one source, potential source, of legitimacy for uh, the court. Why don't we hold that institution accountable? Why do we accept its decisions? We accept it because it's smart people uh, 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 interpreting law, not making public policy. Well. There's not a political scientist on this earth who accepts that view of judicial decision making, especially at the appellate level. Um, you may know the work of uh, Spaeth and Siegel and the attitudinal model, but um, um, uh, as it turns out, for 40 years now, we have uh, examined the question of the role of ideology and values in Supreme Court decision making. We now have the world's greatest example of it, right? So uh, we have uh, a couple of the most conservative people who have ever sat on the court. Uh, I always say, I'm from Houston, and I always say the good thing about humidity is it never goes above 100. Uh, the good thing about conservatism on the court these days is it can't go below 0%. Um, Thomas, Scalia, Alito, and almost Roberts are single digits of conservatives. They vote. Uh, 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 liberal in uh, less than 10% of the time. Uh, Thomas, 4% of the time, votes liberal. So these folks are about as conservative as it gets. Now, we have had nearly 100% liberals on the court. Um, obviously, uh, the, the most liberal liberal is clearly William O. Douglas. Uh, but Brennan um, was a, a very extreme liberal. So. Uh, today, the liberals are not very liberal. The liberals are like 60% liberals, not 90% liberals. But nonetheless, we've got gigantic ideological uh, differences on the court. They align with party. Um, and, um, and, and it's not just true of the Supreme Court. It's true of the federal judiciary. Uh, you can predict the uh, decision of the Circuit Court of Appeal uh, extraordinarily well by knowing one thing. And that is the party of the president who appointed the judge. Um, I won't use anecdotes, but you know it's two to two on health care, right? Well, on federal district court judges, the two say yes on commerce clause, and two say no. And the two Republicans say no, and the two Democrats say yes. And that's in fact a, a very very clear pattern in uh, the judiciary. Uh, 
And I think that's really beyond dispute. Now, obviously, it works a whole lot better at the U.S. Supreme Court, right? Because there's no accountability, not even ambition constrains judges. Whereas on a lower court judge, you know, uh, in my view, is the, the best example of a constrained judge ever, a real careerist, is Kagan, who was dominated by her ambition uh, for all of her life. But once you get to the Supreme Court, there's none of that. So they're absolutely free and to make the decisions they wish, and they're given the opportunity by the fact that they, you know, pick 75 hard cases every year. So the question that really arises, and the question for this paper, is, is it possible <coughs> for people, ordinary people, to understand that the Supreme Court is a policy-making institution that has discretion, that exercises discretion on the basis of ideology, is it possible for that to be understood and legitimacy to be maintained? Now, apparently Obama doesn't think so, right? Because you see, you know, uh, uh, I found it interesting. Uh, Dworkin accused um, uh, Sotomayor of perjury. Because uh, so the earth started out the wise Latina who cared about empathy, and then at the end at the hearings was uh, the uh, the uh, mechanical jurisprudence who did nothing but read and interpret language. So clearly, someone is really afraid of admitting the ideological basis of decision making, the discretionary basis of decision making. Now, uh, maybe I'll let it fair to Obama. He did it to avoid a fight, right? That's his main reason. But clearly, the Supreme Court itself is extraordinarily careful about its legitimacy and extraordinarily careful to deny that it has agency, deny that it has discretion, and believes that this mechanical model will protect its legitimacy. Now, uh, I'll stop there before I go into some of the appearance. Any questions about anything? exactly next. So the question is, if people knew, do people know the truth? If people knew the truth, what would be the consequence? Now here's an interesting finding, uh, replicated all over the world. I've done this work in a ton in South Africa. I used to work in the Soviet Union. I used to work in the EU, all over the place. And here's the finding. The more one knows about a court, the more one extends legitimacy to the court. To know it is to love it. Now that's puzzling, it seems to me. Uh, it's puzzling because the more you know about the court, you know that you lose a lot. That's the first sort of problem. Um, you know, if you don't know very much about the court, you, you kind of think, well, the court's my friend. Uh, you ignore uh, the cases where uh, it rules against your interest. Um, <clears throat> but uh, uh, to know it uh, is, uh, to love it is also curious because you would think that to know more about the institution would lead to a more realist conception of the court, right? To know more is to know that judges have discretion. To know more simply, how can the mechanical jurisprudence be sustained in the face of 5 4? So to know more is to know that the judges are bitterly divided, that they yell at each other all the time, that there's partisan differences. So to know more should detract from, subtract from legitimacy, but that's not the case. But knowing more, would that not also lead to a more cynical view of the court? Because that would just, it would just become another political institution like Congress. And that would drive legitimacy down, right. right up. Absolutely, but the finding is it drives it up. <coughs> but you, you've raised an interesting point. The, the research on Congress says the more you know about Congress, the less legitimacy you give to Congress. It's like the sausage thing, you know, you don't really want to know how it's made. Uh, the more you know about the court, it's exactly the opposite. It drives it up. And that's a paradox to me. That's a paradox. 
Now, yes. Does, does it vary, like, depending on what form of government? So, if let's say we're from the country that the poll is taken is from, uh, they have, like, a th three branch system, and that's been as well accepted and established for a while. Is it, like, the reading different there between the two branches compared to other countries where the people maybe are oppressed or something and they, they look, they want to have a different system of government? Um, you know, we don't have research from every corner of the world. I don't know what the answer, for instance, is in Zimbabwe. Um, I don't know what the answer is in North Korea. Uh, but virtually everywhere that this sort of research has been done, let's just call it 60 countries, uh, the judiciary has a uh, higher frequency uh, <coughs> than any branch of government. Uh, and. Uh, uh, and uh, legitimacy crises are fairly uh, rare. Uh, I really can't answer any more because, you know, most of my work has been in Western Europe, has been in South Africa, uh, where courts are, are reasonably well established. Yes. But maybe to follow up on, on his, but on, on Matt's question, we have a different system of government than say what, let's say, the United Kingdom, where we have more of a separation of power between the executive and the legislative. Does that play a part in even how much legitimacy the, the high court gets? Maybe especially in England where, there, where there's so Good much question. overlap between all three branches, or Good. there was until last year. Good question. I think the intuition is exactly correct, and that the intuition here is that courts get legitimacy from being understood to be different from ordinary political institutions. And what you're suggesting is separation of powers makes that a more credible argument to make with people. It's different. It's not the same as Congress and the presidency. It does something different, and, uh, 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 and therefore we ought to extend more esteem to it. Now, I actually agree with that. I don't think separations of powers has much to do with it. You know what I think it does have to do with it? I'm just starting a major, major new uh, project. It's symbols. Uh, it's symbols. And by that I mean robes, by that I mean wigs, by that I mean cathedral-like buildings, I mean Lady Justice, I mean Oye Oye, I mean Your Honor, I mean an elevated bench, I mean a purple curtain. Uh, our research, which so far has only been uh, uh, done on uh, Stony Brook undergraduates, uh, but we have a grant proposal to extend it, our research shows that if you attach these symbols of law to an unfavorable court opinion, and man, I'm talking about in the weakest possible way, just putting in the background a picture of Lady Justice. If you attach those symbols, you can increase acceptance of opinions by 15 percentage points over a null condition, which in our case is a stack of books, in nondescript books, and an office building. Now what that suggests to me is that people are learning from these symbols. Uh, I don't know if you remember Bush versus Gore, when, when a CNN got outside of the Supreme Court building waiting for the decision, they actually spoke in hushed <coughs> tones. And it was really almost as if they were waiting for the white smoke to come out of the Sistine Chapel to determine who was going to be President of the United States. The deference was stunning, at least to me. And it all uh, conveys this message that the institution is different. And that's an important point for me. People hate Congress. Why? They hate Congress because Congress is self-interested. They don't hate partisanship. That's a bogus uh, argument. What they hate is K Street. What they hate is Congress people being motivated by re-election. I get the money to do it. Abram Hoff, blah, blah. They hate self-interested strategic decision making. Okay. So one way to look at understanding the U.S. Supreme Court is different is mechanical jurisprudence. No one would ever accuse the Senate of mechanical jurisprudence or mechanical legislation, right? I mean, uh, I'm very much in favor of health care. I almost vomited at the procedure that uh, led to health care because I thought it was so wrong, just so fundamentally wrong. Uh, through reconciliation. Uh, anyway, 
So, so people hate Congress because of its procedure. So I was going to ask, do you think it's so much that just because it's different, or it's because the court's obfuscating their actual decision making? Like you can see two senators on the floor arguing and calling each other names. You don't see Kagan and Roberts in conference deciding what they're going to do. Yes, I, I couldn't agree more. So uh, a secrecy at that level is good, although I, at the level of cameras in the courtroom, it's real, real bad. But let me continue just slightly uh, uh, further down the argument path, and I, maybe I can answer that better there. So <coughs> combined with that, is, it, is there any, like a factor, just being out of the public view? So sort of like, uh, even whether you don't see them debating or something, just there's sort of like, to see me is like a privilege. If I, if I withhold myself from public view, I know there was some, um, saw a commentator on the news during the transition between Bush and Obama saying about how uh, strategies for uh, political uh, advisors to presidents is just the amount of public exposure they get and how they how they handle uh, not just you know trying to set up friendly questions for reporters but just limit limiting access in total in all forms is that well let's be careful uh, I would never advocate a uh, televising uh, conference proceedings at the Supreme Court. But I do believe that judges make a great mistake by not uh, being more public in their presence. And so I believe that what courts ought to do is move front and center every chance that they get. Because they've got this arsenal of symbols that are so effective with people. And so I would, if I were uh, king, I would have a, a, a camera in every single courtroom. Because even when people are losing, when Democrats and African Americans paid attention to Bush versus Gore, they were exposed to this overwhelming set of symbols that says this institution is doing something different than an ordinary political institution. And therefore, maybe we ought to respect it. Now, the question is, what's it doing that's different, right? So one answer is mechanical jurisprudence. I think that's the wrong answer. The wrong right answer is principle decision making. But I'll go there in a second. Uh, uh, your, uh, your comment on talking about symbolism is pretty interesting. Does your research uh, indicate that in countries that have less of a separation between church and state, that uh, branches of government who would invoke religious symbols have, tend to have higher legitimacy rankings? Is there any? Now, Any research to support that? There is not, but that's where we're going with the symbols. You know, everyone has written about symbols for a very long time. You know, there's not an ounce of serious research on them. Not an ounce. Now, one of the reasons why is uh, there's no micro theory. Now we have a micro theory uh, uh, discovered by Milt Lodge at uh, Stony Brook. And it's very much like implicit racism. I don't know if you all know implicit racism. And that is subconscious racism that simply cannot be controlled talk about employment law, there's a lot of discussion now about uh, 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 implicit discrimination, non-conscious, uh, non-intentional discrimination that can't be avoided because of the uh, operation of, uh, of, of the sensory perception systems that we have. So uh, 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 the answer is I don't know, but you know, you got to figure, the Catholic Church figured this out 2,000 years ago, right? So, and they've been doing it for 2,000 years or X number of years. And so they must have realized some benefit uh, from it. Um, think of Berkus. We're moving to Europe next on this research. And the role of symbols of Islam or the symbols of the, uh, that are understood to be repressive of women uh, could be just as fantastically influential as, as legal symbols. So we haven't really had the micro-level theory, the type of the system one and system two sensory processing understanding. Now we do, and boy, I, I, I'm real, real excited about this line of research. Now you might know that Judith Resnick at uh, Yale Law School has just published this big book, like, I mean a big book, like real big, uh, like 25 pounds on uh, courtrooms. It's actually a pretty cool book, and she argues that it is the nature of the court building they contribute so much to the legitimacy of law. She didn't have an ounce of data. She's got a lot of pictures. But <laughs> Who's next? 
Does it, you were talking about putting cameras in the court, courtroom. Uh, I've heard other speakers suggest that kind of one of the reasons why the justices don't allow a camera in the Supreme Court is they like being able to go do their grocery shopping in anonymity. Um, to take that a step further, though, I can't turn on the TV without hearing some congressmen pitch how they're the, be the best thing ever. I can't go on TV without hearing uh, the Republican candidates now starting to pitch how they're the best thing ever. And pretty soon, the Democrats, the Obama's going to do the same thing. Uh, politicians are by their nature, or at least elected officials, are by their nature self-serving. The court, by keeping its own, by keeping some of its anonymity, by being someone behind the scenes, doesn't have that. There's, you, you never hear, well, you rarely hear Justice Thomas at all, but you don't really hear Five him. years, right? Five years and counting, boy, I hadn't said a word. But you don't hear Justice Thomas getting up saying, I'm going to read this opinion, and it's going to be great, and you're all going to love me for it. They, they get up, they make brief statements, and then they go away. Does their anonymity, does their, their lack of a search for the limelight help in any way? Well, uh, let's be careful. Um, uh, first, I would challenge your argument in recent times because like never before in American history have we seen Supreme Court justices going public the way we have in the, in the last several years. And I'm talking about, I don't know if Thomas has been on a book tour with the autobiography, but Breyer's been all over the place. Scalia's all over the place all the time on everything, right? Tea Party and uh, all of that. Uh, and so I think we've got far more visible justices than we've had in the past. But what I'm talking about, really, is showing them at work, right? And what I would say to judges is put cameras in, uh, wear your wigs. You know, the, the new UK Supreme Court has abandoned wigs. I think that's a real mistake. Uh, some judges don't use robes. I think that's a mistake. Uh, 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 the Americans uh, forswear, to a considerable degree, Latin. And that's probably a mistake. I mean, they've got this arsenal of uh, persuasive tools, and uh, to not use them strikes me as crazy. Um, I have a couple of friends on the Constitutional Court of uh, South Africa. It turns out that that court has very low legitimacy, among the lowest of any I've seen in the world. And so I say to the court, uh, they're all elitist, you know, almost all judges are elitist. And so I say to these judges, uh, uh, first they forswore justice, they're called judges. Now, that's probably not a gigantic deal. But I say to them, you know, go out and meet people. Wear robes. Use these symbols. Try to show to people that you're different. And if you do so, you'll enhance your legitimacy. Um, yes. Is it um, certain research that connects it with um, sort of people's innate characteristics? So, or, or like a, a choices? So, for instance, if I have a dispute with somebody, I know that I need a neutral forum, neutral forum, someone else to resolve it. And so just from, like, pragmatically, I look for uh, an institution to resolve it. And the, uh, as long as an institution purports to fulfill that role somewhat well, then, then I'm, I'm, I'm happy with it or I'm, I acknowledge it. Uh, and also, so that's one question, I guess, or another question, is there any, like with the idea of symbols, is there any way that that ties into sort of a, like a, uh, I think, I don't know what, it's, what the secular term is, but it's um, heard it called the universal event of worship, where there's uh, mankind societies throughout all time are always looking for a deity. Is, so is there a source, a source of authority, a, a provider, a protector, a, source of meaning? Is there, so is symbols sort of connected with? Um, I, I don't know very much about the latter. I, I kind of reject the premise, um, but I don't know of any real evidence on it. Um, uh, 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 let, let, let me jump into the argument about discretion and come back to that for a second, okay? Because uh, where I want to go is the question of whether you can know it's connected, whether you can know that these guys are ideological and still extend legitimacy. You say that people are looking for neutral arbiters, okay? Uh, well, if that's the case, and you know that the chance of Scalia voting liberal is 4%, does that mean that you have to, that you withdraw, you no longer treat that institution 
as neutral and therefore you withdraw. Now I was going to interject, there's a brilliant study of litigation after Franco. In Spain people wouldn't litigate under Franco because they thought the courts were not fair. And it's just a magnificent relationship, a gigantic increase in litigiousness every year after the death of, of Franco. And we use uh, a, a willingness to turn to the courts and seek resolution of conflict as evidence of the legitimacy of those courts after the uh, decline of Franco. But so the question is, if you know that, uh, if you know uh, uh, that uh, for a federal district court judge, knowing his or her uh, party of appointing president uh, uh, allows fantastic prediction of the outcome, does that undermine legitimacy? Now you would think that it would, wouldn't you? You would think that people would see it as partisan, and they hate partisan, blah, blah, all that kind of argument. But that turns out not to be the case. To know the court is to love it. To know the court is compatible with understanding that they have discretion and that they are ideological decision makers. It is compatible. You don't have to believe in mechanical jurisprudence. But what these symbols have taught uh, the American people, and I'll come back to other countries in a minute, what these symbols have taught the American people is that they're different. How are they different? They're principled. The Americans accept discretion. They accept ideology so long as it's not self-serving. So they'll accept a Scalia because Scalia is not first connected to K Street, although he was connected to Cheney, of course, on the question of killing animals. But they accept uh, Scalia because he makes principled decisions. They accept uh, uh, Ginsburg, despite the fact that she was ACLU counsel. They accept her because she makes principled decisions. Now, how do they know that? They know that first through symbols. I actually believe that, uh, that uh, the role of precedent actually is fairly important here. I don't believe for a second that judges uh, decisions are caused by precedent. Not for a second. They make decisions first and they find the precedent second. But you might know that round one did not use precedent. Round one was written by Earl Warren, right? And Earl Warren was Republican governor of Texas, of uh, California. And he made a deal with Eisenhower in the Republican primary of 52. And Eisenhower put him on the Supreme Court. He's preeminently a political animal, unlike the ones we have today. And so Earl Warren wrote Brown One to communicate with ordinary people so it could be published in the Sunday newspapers of the American South. He did it directly as an appeal to the people. I think that was a mistake. I think, you know, maybe nothing's going to change white Southerners. So maybe it didn't make a difference. But I think Warren denied himself Latin, uh, footnotes, uh, precedents, uh, denied himself the tools that make the uh, decisions appear to be principled, and in doing so, subtracted from the legitimacy of the institution. Now, as I say, that's probably not a good example because nothing would have been different had he done it otherwise. But nonetheless, I think the point is that, that uh, what, we, what judges have to do is convince people that they're making principled decisions. And anything that contributes to that contributes to legitimacy. Now that's, that's I think, a, a, a different idea, right? So what that means is that maybe a Supreme Court nominee can actually be frank at the hearings, right? Uh, I published a book last year on Alito nomination. And when people paid attention to the advancements <coughs> on Alito, uh, the legitimacy of the U.S. Supreme Court went down. And those advertisements were as politicized as you can get. I mean, if you turn, if, if you struck out the words and just kind of uh, uh, looked at the images, you would see an ordinary political ad. The right wing has taken over the White House. Uh, now they want the Supreme Court. Uh, blah, blah, blah. They, they look and feel just like ordinary attack ads. So when people paid attention to those, the Supreme Court's legitimacy did actually go down. When, however, they paid attention to the debate in the Senate, 
the legitimacy went up. Now you might remember Alito was a super duper president debate. Okay? And there was some pretty tough questioning. My own view of that is that judges can in fact discuss cases and discuss doctrines uh, and do so with <coughs> disagreement, in fact sharp disagreement. But so long as the proceedings are uh, portrayed as principled, uh, it, it uh, uh, does no damage uh, to the legitimacy of the Supreme Court. I'll just say one more thing and then I'll shut up for a while. Um, you know, the same is true of Republican Party of Minnesota versus Y. The 2002 decision that allowed judges free speech. So judges can now tell us uh, their positions on policy issues. Uh, that is a change that, of course, the, the uh, minority uh, thought would uh, undermine the legitimacy of courts. That's a change that dramatically enhances the legitimacy of courts. People want to know policy. Uh, they don't trust judges, uh, don't have a shred of evidence, but I just bet you a nickel that when Clarence Thomas said that he had never read Roe versus Wade, no one believed him. Everyone thought he was a liar. So if Clarence Thomas had said, I've read Roe, and I think it was wrongly decided, that's the kind of disagreement that people can accept. Uh, so if it's, uh, so, so if we had a more uh, substantive <coughs> confirmation hearing, I liken it to Republican Party of Minnesota versus White, and believe that uh, people would understand that there are important differences. There are, but they're principled, <coughs> strategic. I imagine that corruption, scandals, malfeasance in, in any branch of government causes it to legitimacy. Is but a, do judicial scandals and judicial corruption problems uh, when they occur, do they harm the legitimacy of the judiciary in the same way as the? Because I, I think there's a recent, I think even ongoing, there's a, a uh, judge taking kickbacks from like this prison company uh, for sending lots of juveniles to these prison companies. Yes. And you know that's you know that's a scandalous, of course, and I think you know should undermine at least some legitimacy of at least that court. But is the impact as great as it would be in if similar circumstances in other branches? Now here's what you have to be a little bit careful about, and I've encouraged you to be fuzzy in your thinking on it. Here's what you have to be careful about, and that is the difference between the incumbent and the institution. So uh, a bad behavior on the part of an incumbent in an institution does not necessarily rub off on the institution itself. It doesn't necessarily. Okay. So my guess is Pennsylvanians view these judges as crooks, and, and it had little impact on the institution uh, itself. Now where I encouraged you to think wrongly about this is I spoke about Alito and then the dependent variable was the legitimacy of the Supreme Court. Uh, I'm not, uh, I don't care too much about whether people supported Alito's nomination or not. What I was talking about is the spillover effect of these advertisements that you know may cause you to like Alito, may cause you not to like him. But the spillover was to say the Supreme Court is just like any other political institution. So it's almost a secondary message in the advertisement, with the primary being the occupant, the role occupant, and the second being the institution itself. So, uh, OK, could we think of an example of really bad behavior uh, that did or did not affect the institution? I would put uh, Nixon. Did Nixon uh, undermine the legitimacy of the presidency? Maybe we can have an argument of, on that, uh, War Powers Act and so on, but maybe not. Or at least they have a short term. I think usually in bad incumbents don't spill over to damage the institution itself. Now, it depends. I mean, I'll argue in two hours' time that uh, the uh, that. Uh, the, uh, in the West Virginia uh, Supreme Court that Caperton did have a broader impact. But it had a broader impact because people saw it as part of the ordinary style of doing business on the West Virginia Supreme Court. It, it seems like putting a statue of a lady with a blindfold in a room and that increasing the legitimacy of a decision seems really artificial. It seems like a, a facade for a court to do that. As a society, should we discourage a court from 
using these symbols in order to kind of strip away the um, the artificial support that's increasing the court's legitimacy? You know, that's a fair question. Almost implicitly, I've always been talking as if legitimacy were a good thing, right? Uh, it's like Tom Tyler and procedural justice. I mean, um, you know, uh, um, I've read every single word that Tom Tyler has written. And so I know and know effectively how to manipulate undergraduates when they come into my office and want a grade change. And so I could say, uh, no, uh, get out of here. Or I could say, you know, uh, let me think about it. Why don't you tell me your side of the story? Let me listen attentively. Let me make you think that I'm giving your argument full consideration. I'm giving you voice. I'm a neutral and an impartial uh, arbiter. And so I do all that, and then I say no. So procedure is manipulated uh, to, uh, to legitimize or get acceptance of an outcome, and it's done uh, consciously. And so maybe that is a bad thing. Um, of course, the problem that courts face, if they're going to be effective at all, uh, is a, a legitimacy deficit. Like in the U.S. system, we have the counter-majoritarian dilemma, right? So the, U, the federal courts, not the Supreme Court, but the federal courts start off with the gigantic deficit. Because where do democratic institutions get legitimacy at their core? consent at their core accountability. So you put life terms on a non-accountable institution and they've got a problem from the very, very beginning. So, and then you add the class that they don't have the purse and they don't have the sword. These guys are in big trouble uh, from the very beginning. So if you want that institution to be effective in any meaningful way, it's got to have some resources to build this, this legitimacy. Uh, as a social scientist, I try not to engage normative issues uh, that much as to whether you know the court's legitimacy could be used in a good or bad way. Um, of course, we know over the course of American history that the U.S. Supreme Court has been a dramatically conservative institution. So anything that enhances the uh, power of that court enhances conservatism. That's sort of the natural implication of that argument. Oh, should it be grounded in rationality? I don't know. You know, political scientists, George Marcus and a bunch of people are arguing that uh, uh, affect, uh, affective intelligence, for instance, is enormously important, uh, and legitimately so. I mean, there's a lot of, um, of a role of emotion in politics that need not be stamped out, but in fact could be a very important uh, and legitimate factor in it's a much bigger argument. Yes? Um, it seems interesting to me that the more symbols a court has, the more legitimate it is, but to know the court is to love it. Um, but don't you think more symbols gets in the way of people knowing the court? The more footnotes, um, more Latin, um, people can't really know the court. So, I mean, it just seems like it clashes in a way. I think what you're probably thinking uh, is of a higher level of knowledge of the courts than what I'm thinking of. Okay? So um, uh, my argument is that when, when people know more, they know more about the special function of the court uh, in uh, the constitutional system. And uh, that's not a very high level of knowledge by a million miles, right? And so what I'm suggesting is that when they acquire this information, they're simultaneously being exposed to these symbols that reinforce the, 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 the knowledge. And that's all it needs to be, the knowledge that this court is different, this institution is different. This is not a, a mini Congress, a nine member Congress. It's different. And so, uh, you know, maybe if we went to a very, very, very high level of knowledge, it becomes curvilinear or something like that. But that's a level that most people in every political system do not, do not achieve. So the knowledge, I'm not saying it's knowledge per se. I'm not saying it's knowledge per se. I'm saying whatever causes knowledge, attentiveness, blah, blah, all the things that cause knowledge, what, when you pay attention because of Bush versus Gore, what's happening is you're learning that they made a 5-4, but you're also being exposed subliminally, and I do actually mean in a subconscious way, 
you're being exposed to these symbols that enhance the idea that this court, this institution is different. And it's that difference that uh, propels legitimacy. You know, but, um, I know some people have class at 10. So does somebody want to have the last question? Or do you want to give a couple of final thoughts? Yeah, I, I was going to ask you if you could sort of sum up then. So what you were just saying there, it seems like you're saying there's a learning, like up to a point, more knowledge is good. Because I was going to say, I actually lost some respect for the court. Or just like when I came into law school, I thought you had to know English history to be able to speak Latin and blah, blah. And now I see it's more of an ordinary thing to be a lawyer than I would nor anticipate. Or when I read court decisions, I would automatically just think, well, they're right. But now that I know better, I say, I disagree with them, and this is why. And, or I say, they just made this decision because of a pragmatic consideration or something. So is there a learning curve? And then also, if you could just sum up again, then some factors that you say, so like principled, um, uh, problem, or, or things that you can do, or the courts can do to add legitimacy and things to stay away from. Okay, uh, you know, I, uh, I'm an expert on the mass public. I'm not an expert on elites. Uh, so when you talk about uh, uh, very high levels of knowledge, I'm not really sure uh, how, uh, the, how that works. Uh, uh, I am involved in a lot of litigation, and boy, if there's discretion in anything, there's discretion in um, a class action certification. Uh, and so uh, I uh, see uh, the enormous power that judges can have, and I see the role of ideology. Now, uh, in my own uh, experiences, uh, that does not detract from legitimacy, because I don't believe that the judge who's deciding against me, and they usually do decide against me, the judge who decided against me is doing it so in a self-interested way, that the judge is deciding against me because he or she's a conservative doesn't believe that uh, uh, ordinary people ought to have broad access to the judiciary. Now, I disagree with that, but I don't consider that to be an inappropriate or illegitimate position to take, and therefore, I don't believe um, I, 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 it doesn't suffer. Um, I know we are out of time. Uh, you know, the Supreme Court understands all this. Now, I send them all my papers and books, and I assume that they've read them and committed them to heart. But if even if they haven't, uh, they tell us all the time that their legitimacy is fragile, that they're extremely mindful. You know, the super-duper precedent debate was stupid at a certain level, but at a certain level it wasn't. And what it was saying is that once a really important principle like a, a, a row gets established and is around for a long period of time, you've got to think very, very carefully about changing it. Okay. And all of that, Casey, read Casey. I mean, it's a textbook on how much the, the court cares about uh, maintaining its legitimacy. So, uh, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, my own view is, as I say, is that exposure is beneficial. They've got the tools. If they want to enhance the legitimacy, they ought to go on speaking tours. They ought to go on Oprah. We ought to have Scalia on Oprah. And what uh, uh, to what format can we look at your you said your beginning of study? Are you publishing a paper or a book that we should be looking for? You know the uh, the Alito book published last year by Princeton is actually a pretty good book. Uh, it's a good book uh, in the following sense: uh, there's a lot of theory in it. Uh, you may not care about Alito. I don't care about Alito, uh, but it is the major statement of positive positivity theory. Uh, and uh, I think you might find it useful, uh, I'll say very quickly, uh, chapter two is a revolutionary chapter on the uh, question of the level of knowledge of the American people. You've probably heard a million times say, no, the seven dwarfs more than the nine uh, supremes, right? All of that's wrong, all of that's wrong. And chapter two of that book uh, documents the way in which it's wrong. So the book, I think, on many dimensions is, um, is uh, worth uh, looking at, and uh, I can uh, give you this. Thing. All right. Well, thank you very much.